our nation's founding, a man sat in the waiting light of a chilled autumn day, not unlike today. It had been a busy time, sorting through the few belongings left behind by the late Deirdrick Knickerbocker. Knickerbocker was a reserved man who spoke so little that when he did voice an opinion, or what was more to the truth, a conclusion, those about him gave heed. And so, it was with great interest the man lifted the dusty sheets of parchment bound together by a rather ominous blood-red ribbon. He leaned in close to read the ink, faded yet legible. What have we here? The Castle of Indolence. A poem. A pleasing sound. A dreary heads it was. Of dreams that wave before the half-shut eyes. And of bright castles in the clouds that pass forever flushing round a summer sky. This simple introduction was enough to entice our man, not having any pressing engagements and having a candle at ready for the imminent setting of the sun to untie the ribbon. Making himself comfortable with feet propped up on the lately deceased desk, he leaned back in his chair with a feeling of great anticipation of what was to come. In the heart of one of the spacious coves, which indent the eastern shore of the Hudson River, there lies a small market port, which some call by the name of Tarrytown. This name was given, we are told, by the good housewives of the adjacent country, whom the propensity of their husbands to linger about the village tavern on market days. That good for nothing Phineas Durfee is once again late for the evening milking. M mistress, I, I do believe that's him. C coming down late now? Heaven be blessed. The young'uns are already in bed. You'd best be off then, best before it gets any darker. Thank you, Mom. I don't like crossing church with long after twilight. Not far from the village called Terrytown, there is a little valley among high hills, which is one of the quietest places in the whole world. A small brook glides to it, with just murmur enough. Lull into repose. And the occasional whistle of a quail or tapping of a woodpecker. It's almost the only sound that ever breaks in upon the uniform tranquility of this little valley, long known by the name of Sleepy Hollow. A drowsy, dreamy influence seemed to hang over the land and to pervade the very atmosphere. Some say the place was bewitched during the early days of the settlement. Certainly, it is. The place still continues under some sway of some witching power that holds a spell over the minds of the good people. They are given to all kinds of marvelous beliefs and frequently see, see strange sights and hear music and voices in the air. The whole neighborhood abounds with local tales, haunted spots, and twilight superstitions. Would you believe? It's true, though. Yesterday night, I saw an apple drop plum down at Gopher Hole. And guess where I didn't see it? Right near the Blue George Shack. Now don't ye know there will be no leaving port tomorrow as it's All Hallows' Eve. And we all know that the earth is then transformed till All Saints' Day. So any ships that depart are never to be seen again. Beware the werewolf of Red Coat Manor. 
the rickety rotten shed of Old Man Erie. The three-headed croaking frog of Cranky Creek. Father, Father, I just saw it. Saw what, son? I saw it, the three-headed frog. Now, my boy, you know no one has heard high nor tale of that since O2. But Father, I saw it, it was huge, and it had three heads. I was, I was over by Cranky Creek. Oh my, I bless your dear departed mother. <laughs> May she rest in peace. Cranky Creek? Son, you know better than through milking round near Cranky Creek. That place is haunted, you know. <laughs> Grandmother heard a great ringing at the f at Frosted Glade at the last full moon. Remember now, if an squirrel does across your path, be sure to sprinkle salt in your right shoe before the next crossing, or you'll have the devil to pay. Speaking of the very devil himself, me boy Yanni tells me a fortnight past who's riding through the woods to the north when he come by to find that his wife had been transfigured into the town barmaid. Yeah, and he says that that was all the cause of all the yelling I overheard last week when I went to do the sewing. If his wife weren't so sharp in her tongue and addled in her braids, he wouldn't have been so shrewish towards me boy. Anyone with half a wit of understanding can plainly see that he is even paying more attention to her urgent talisman than, than to be ridden in place of such demons and taking a wrath out on my poor lad. The dominant spirit ever that haunts this enchanted region is the apparition of a figure on a horseback without a head. Beware, the ghost of the soldier killed in the Revolutionary War, his head was to clean off in the battle, carried away by a cannonball. I, this body having been buried in the churchyard, rides forth in ghostly form to the scene of battle in nightly quest of its head. Yeah, and the rushing speed with which he sometimes passes along the hall, like a midnight blast, is on to his being malignant, and in a hurry to get back to churchyard before daybreak. This legendary superstition is known at all country firesides by the name of the Headless Horseman of Sleepy Hollow. In this quiet place of nature, there abode a worthy wight of the name of Ichabod Crane, who sojourned, or, as he expressed it, was buried in Sleepy Hollow for the purpose of instructing the children of the city. His head was small and flat at top, with huge ears and large gray glassy eyes, and a long sight nose. It looked like a weather god. It looked like a weather god perched upon his spindle neck to tell which way the wind blew. To see him starting along the profile of the hill on a windy day, with his clothes bagging and fluttering about him, one might have mistaken him for the image of famine descending upon the earth or some scarecrowy loaf from a cornfield. From the schoolhouse, the low murmur of the Kabob Crane's pupils' voices might be heard, like the hum of a beehive, interrupted now and then by the authoritative voice of the master, in the tone of menace or command or providenture, by the appalling sound of the perch switch, as he urged some party leader along the flowery path of knowledge. Sorry, Master Crane, I promise I'll try harder next time. You'd better. Or there's more where this came from. Oh! Infernal noise of child squeaking. It's enough to wake the dead. <gasps> That's enough! Back to your readers. If you aren't the most superstitious bunch of country bumpkins, then my name isn't Ichabod Crane. Truth to say, Master Crane was a conscientious man, and ever bore in mind the golden maxim, Spare the rod, and spoil the child. And we scholars certainly were not spoiled. Master Crane administered justice with discrimination, rather than severity. All this he called, Doing my duty to their parents. And Master Crane never inflicted a chastisement without following it by his assurance. So conciliatory to me, smarty urchins. You'll remember this, and thank me for it later.
When school hours were over and on holiday afternoons, Ichabod would convey some small ones home, who happened to have pretty sisters or good housewives for mothers, known for the comforts of their cupboard. Indeed, it behooved him to keep on good terms with his pupils, whose revenue arising from his school was small and would have been scarcely sufficient to furnish him with daily bread, for he was a huge feeder, and though Link had the dilating powers of an anaconda. The schoolmaster is generally a man of some importance in the female circle of a rural neighborhood. Our man of letters, therefore, was peculiarly happy in the smiles of all the country damsels. In addition to his other vocations, he was the singing master of the neighborhood, instructing the young folks in psalmody. Inasmuch as his salary was of pittance, he drew in a few bright shillings by the teaching of singing lessons. Together, round tones, please, for heaven's sake. Oh, for heaven's sake, placement, resonate. Oh dear, we may have to perform an alternative. Dear, dear. Be sure to arrive at service half an hour early on Sunday to rehearse. It was a matter of no little vanity to him on Sundays to take a station in front of the church gallery with a band of chosen singers. In his own mind, Ichabod completely carried away the palm from the parson. Arise. Let the be sung. Sir, and it is, his voice resounded far above all the rest of the congregation, and there are peculiar quavers still to be heard in that church, and which may even be heard half a mile off, quite to the opposite side of the mill pond. Through every land, by every tongue. Indeed, on many a Sunday, Praise to God on high descended up from the nose of Ichabod Crane. <laughs> Ichabod would then figure among the female folks between services on Sundays, gathering grapes from them in the wild vines of the surrounding trees, or sauntering a whole bevy of them, reciting to their amusements the epitaphs on the tombstones. Oh, Master Crane, read this one next. Very um, deep. A man of deep understanding, gone too soon. Here's my favorite. Here I lie, but don't you cry. Soon enough, you too will die. R.I.P. Izzy dead yet. Here's the old father's grave. Near this spot, Samuel Whitmore, then 80 years old, was shot, slashed, beaten, and left for dead by ruffians. He recovered and died peacefully in his sleep at age 98. <laughs> October 31st, 1739. Living is the best revenge. Ichabod Crane was an odd mixture of small shrewdness and simple credulity. He was a perfect master of Mather's history of New England witchcraft in which he most firmly and potently believed in. It was often his life after his school was dismissed in the afternoon, to stretch himself on a rich bed of clover bordering the little brook that whimpered by his schoolhouse. And there read over old Mather's direful tales until the gathering of dusk made the page before his eyes merely a mist. Then, as he wended his way by swamp and stream in awful woodland, the farmhouse where he happened to be quartered, every sound of nature at that witching hour fluttered his excited imagination. The moan of the whippoorwill from the hillside. The boated cry of the tree toad, that harbinger of storm. <laughs> the dreary hooting of the screech owl. <laughs> or the sudden rustling in the thicket of birds frightened from their roost. The fireflies too, which struck almost vividly in the darkest places, now and then startled them, as one of uncommon brightness, which was the path. 
And if, by chance, a huge blockhead of a beetle came winging his blundering flight against him, the poor varlet was ready to give up the ghost, with the idea that he was struck with the witch's token. His only resource on such occasions, either to drown, thought, or drive away evil spirits, was to sing psalm tunes and the good people of Sleepy Hollow, as they sat by their doors of an evening, were often filled with an awe at hearing his nasal melody floating from the distant hill or along the dusky road. Another of his sources of fearful pleasure was to pass long winter evenings with old wives as they sat spinning by the fire with rows of apples roasting and spluttering along the hearth and listen to their marvelous tales of ghosts and goblins. And haunted fields and haunted brooks. And haunted bridges. And haunted houses. And particularly of the, the headless horseman. But if there was a pleasure in all this telling of tales, while snugly cuddling in the chimney corner of a chamber that was all aglow from the crackling wood fire, where, of course, no specter dared show its face, it was dearly purchased by the terrors of his subsequent walk homewards, what fearful shapes and shadows beset his path amidst the dim and ghastly glare of a snowy night. Ah! Who's there? Oh, this is a snow-covered shrubs. mid often shrink was curdling awe at the sound of his own steps on the frosty crust beneath his feet, and dread to look over his shoulder. Who goes there? He should behold some uncouth being tramping close behind him, and how often was he thrown in complete dismay? Ah! By some rushing blast, howling among the trees, in the idea that it was the galloping horseman on one of his nightly scoundrels. <laughs> it's him! It's him! Heaven mercy! Have mercy on my poor soul! All these, however, were mere terrors of the night, phantoms of the mind that walks in darkness. Daylight put an end to all of these evils, and Ichabod would have passed a pleasant life of it, in despite of the devil and all his works, if his path had not been crossed by a being that causes more perplexity to mortal man than ghosts, goblins, and the whole race of witches put together. And that was... a wolf. Good day to ye, Miss Katrina. How's your mother, Miss Katrina? Can I carry your basket, Miss Katrina? No need of that, sir. I am a quiet Am I right, Miss Katrina? Gentlemen, what would I do without you both? As my mother has sent me for a bushel of apples as well. Katrina Van Tassel was the daughter and only child of a substantial Dutch farmer. She was a blooming lass of 18, plump as a partridge, ripe and melting and rosy-cheeked as one of her father's peaches, and universally famed, not merely for her beauty, but also for her vast expectations. It is not to be wondered at that so tempting a morsel soon found favor in Ichabod Crane's eyes, more especially after he had visited her in her paternal mansion. The teacher's mouth watered as he looked upon the sumptuous promise of luxurious winter fare. Look at how that salt pork and bacon. He rolled his gray green eyes over the fat meadow lands, the rich fields of wheat, of rye, of buckwheat, and Indian corn, and the urchins burdened with ruddy, ruddy fruit, who surrounded the tenement of Van Tassel, and his heart yearned for the damsel who was to inherit these domains. So much food! Wheat bread, rice rolls, corn cake, and all the apples I can eat! When he entered the house, seeing the claw-footed chairs and dark mahogany tables, laden with food, the conquest of his heart was complete, and his only study was how to gain the affections of Katrina, the peerless daughter of Van Tassel. Oh, to be master of so much bounty, I must have the lovely Katrina to wife. In this enterprise, however, he had to encounter a host of fearful adversaries, her numerous rustic admirers, who kept a watchful and angry eye upon each other, but were ready to fly out in the common cause against any new competitor. Among these, the most formidable was a burly, roaring, roistering Brom Van Brunt. He was broad-shouldered and double-jointed, with short curly black hair, not an unpleasant countenance, having a mingled air of fun and arrogance. 
Good afternoon, Brom. Miss Molly, good day to you. Fine day for a stroll, don't you think, Brom? Surely, Lizzie. That is if Miss Katrina is available. Well, I'm looking forward to the harvest party, Brom. I'll say two dances for you. The Fantastas do know how to make a grand time for all. I have a hunch it will be a very memorable evening indeed. Brahma's famed for his skill in horsemanship. He was always either ready for a fight or a frolic. But, truth be told, I have more mischief than ill will in my composition. Fair enough, fair enough. Granted, no one will argue that. And even with all Brom Bones' overbearing roughness, there was a strong dash of waggish good humor at bottom. This unruly hero had for some time singled out the gloomy Katrina for the often divisive actions. Such was the competitor that Ichabod Crane had to contend, and, considering all things, a stouter man than he would have shrunk from the competition, and a wiser man than he would have despaired. From the moment Brom Bones became aware of Ichabod's advances, a deadly feud arose between them. And Ichabod became the object of whimsical persecution to Bones and his gang of rough riders. They harried his hitherto peaceful domains, smoked out his school by stopping up the chimney, broke into the schoolhouse at night, and turned everything topsy turvy, so that the poor schoolmaster thought that all the rest of the country were holding a meeting stand. But what was still more annoying is that Rob took all the opportunities of turning him into ridicule and the lovely Katrina. Even that scoundrel dog who he taught to fight in the most ludicrous manner. Making him as a rival of Katrina. Miss Katrina, let us sit near the fire. What's that you say, Master Crane? Dad, I feel chill, so let us move closer to the fire. You feel ill and wish to retire? No! no. That's fine. I should be going anyways. Very well. Good night, Master Crane. In this way, matters went on for some time, until one fine autumnal afternoon, an invitation arrived, summoning Ichabod into a quilting frolic at the Ventassa's farm that very night. The gallant Ichabod spent extra half an hour brushing up his best, and indeed only suit of rusty glass, and arranging his locks by a bit of broken quilting glass that hung up in the schoolhouse. She loves me, she loves me not. <laughs> He borrowed a broken down plow horse named Gunpowder from a farmer he was lodging with. Oh, and I remember seeing him on the way to the Amen Tassels. He rode with short stirrups that brought him all the way to his knees, that brought him up to the nearly the pommel of his saddle. His sharp elbows stuck out like grasshoppers. <laughs> <laughs> and he carried his whip perpendicularly in his hand, like a scepter. <laughs> As his horse jogged on, the motion of his arms was not unlike the flapping of a pair of wings, and the skirts of his black coat fluttered almost out to the horse's tail. As Ichabod perched on ungold powder, jogged slowly on his way, the sky was clear and serene, and nature wore the rich and gold livery, which we always associate with the idea of abundance. The forest had put on their sober brown and yellow, while some trees tinder cut of the tinder kind had been nipped by the frost into bright, brilliant dyes of orange, purple, and scarlet. It was toward evening that Ichabod arrived at the castle of the heir Van Tassel, which he found thronged with the pride and flower of the adjacent country. Brom Bones, however, was the hero of the scene, having come to the gathering on his favorite steed Daredevil, a creature, like himself, full of metal and mischief, and which no one but himself could manage. Hello, Brom. Lovely evening, Brom. I'm looking forward to our dances, Brom. Ladies, ladies, all in good time. Ah, there's our host. Let us raise a glass to air Baltus Ventassi. I pause in our story to dwell upon the world of charms that burst upon the enraptured gaze of our hero. As he entered the parlor of the Van Tassel's mansion, the ample charms of, of a genuine Dutch country tea table in the sumptuous time of autumn, such heaped up platters of cakes of various and almost indescribable kinds. Oh, look at the doughy donut. 
and then tender, oily food. And the crispy, crumbly ruler. So many sweet cakes, and short cakes, and ginger cakes, and honey cakes. Oh dear, oh my. Look at all the pies. Mm. Oh, apple pies, peach pies, and pumpkin pies. Oh dear, oh my. Look at all the piles and slices of ham. Oh, and smoked beef. And not to mention broiled fish and roasted chickens. Oh my goodness, look at all the bowls of milk and cream. Ow. Heaven bless the mark. I want breath and time to discuss this banquet as it deserves, but I'm too eager to go on with my story. Happily, Ichabod Crane was not in so great a hurry as his historian, but did ample justice to every dainty. <laughs> Old Baltus Van Tassel moved about among his guests with a face dilated with content and good humor, round and jolly as the harvest moon, as the music summoned from the hall to the dance. Fall to, and help yourselves. Have another. There's more where that came from. Ichabod prided himself upon his dancing as much as his vocal powers. Not a limb, not a fiber about him was idle. How could the flogger of urchins be otherwise than animated and joyous? The lady of his heart was his partner in the dance, and smiling graciously in reply to all his amorous oglings, while Brom Bones, sorely smitten with love and jealousy, sat brooding himself in one corner. When the dance was at an end, Ichabod was attracted to a knot of sager folks who sat smoking at one end of the room, gossiping over former times and drawing out long stories about the war. Dofu Martling, a large blue bearded Dutchman, would have taken a British frigate with an old iron nine pounder, only that his gun burst at the sixth discharge. I remember the old gentleman in the Battle of White Plains, how he parried a musket ball with a small sword. He often felt it whiz around the blade and glance off at the hilt. I saw the dent in the hilt with my very own eyes. But all these were nothing to the tales of ghosts and apparitions. I heard the Dower's milkman saw the white lady coming through Raven's Blood near midnight during the last new moon. She was coming home from assisting at a stillbirth, or yonder in Terrytown. Honest signs to be sure. The lady is often known to shriek on winter nights before a storm, having perished there in the snow. The chief part of stories, however, turned upon the favorite specter of Sleepy Hollow, the Headless Horseman. I've heard tales that he has been out and about of late patrolling the country. Shh! Best not be heard speaking aloud of that specter since you'll need be crossing his bridge this very evening. I. Tom Jenkins saw his ghostly seat tethered among the tombstones at the Old White Church, coming home from a late night in Terrytown just last week. I heard tales 
that old brewer, the most heretical disbeliever in ghosts, met the horseman returning from Sleepy Hollow. Yeah, and he was obliged to get up behind him. They galloped over brush and brake, hill and swan, until they reached the bridge, when the horseman suddenly turned into a skeleton, threw old brewer over the bridge, and sprang away with the treetops in a clap of thunder. I say the horseman is an errant jockey not fit for his saddle. Let me explain. Sure as you're sitting there one night when I was returning from Ford's village, I was overtaken by this midnight trooper. No. What did you do, Brom? Well, I offered to race him for a bullet punch. <laughs> and I should have wanted to, for my horse Daredevil beat the goblin horse fair and square. But just as we came to the church bridge, the headless horseman bolted and vanished in a flash of fire. All these tales told in drowsy undertone in which men talk in the dark. The countenances of the listeners only now in receiving the casual gleam of a glare of a pipe sank deep in the mind of Ichabod. The revel now gradually broke up. Ichabod only lingered behind, according to the custom of country levels, to a tete-a-tete with the heiress, Katrina. But past all this interview, I will not kind of say, for in fact I do not know. Something, however, I fear he must have gone wrong, for he certainly sighed for when they are quite desolate and chapped home. Oh, he's woman. He's woman. Oh, could that girl have been playing one of her coquettish tricks? Is her... Is her encouragement all a mere sham? To increase the jealousy in my rivals, heaven only knows, not I. <laughs> Without looking to the right or left, he went straight to the stables and with several hearty cuffs and kicks, roused his steed most uncourteously. How? Get up! Go on, you mangy old bag of bones! Where's the very witch behind you? And Ichabod, heavy pardoning, must fall on pursued his travels homewards. The hour was as dismal as himself. In the dead hush of midnight, he could even hear the watchdog from the opposite shore of the huts. <laughs> now and then, the long drawn crowing of a cock accidentally awakened would sound far, far away from some farmhouse away among the hills. No signs of life occurred near him, but occasionally the melancholy chirp of a cricket, or perhaps the guttural twang of a bullfrog from a neighboring marsh, as if sleeping uncomfortably and turning suddenly in his bed. All the stories of ghosts and goblins that he had heard in the afternoon now came crowding upon his recollection. The night grew darker and darker. The star, the star, sink, de sink deeper in the sky, and dry clouds occasionally them from his sight. Ichabod had never felt so lonely and dismal. Approaching the very place where many of the scenes of ghost stories had been laid, he began to whistle. Mm -hmm. He thought his whistle was answered. It was but a blast sweeping sharply through the dry tree branches. A small brook crossed the road and ran into a marshy and thickly wooded glen. It has ever been considered haunted. As he approached the stream, Ichabod's heart began to thump. He summoned up, however, all his resolution, gave his horse half a score of kicks in the ribs, and attempted to, to dash briskly across the bridge. But instead of starting forward, the perverse old animal came to a stand just by the bridge, with a suddenness that had nearly sent his rider sprawling over his head. What in tarnation, you good-for-nothing brute of a beast! On with you! Yeah. Just at this moment, a planchy tramp by the side of the bridge caught the sensitive ear of Ichabod. In the dark shadow of the grove, on the marsh of the brook, he beheld something huge, misshapen, and towering. But it stirred not, but seemed gathering up in the gloom, like some gigantic monster ready to spring upon the traveler. The hair of the affrighted schoolmaster rose upon his head with terror. What was to be done? 
to turn and fly was now too late summoning up. Therefore, a show of courage, he demanded in stammering accents, Who, who are you? He received no reply, repeating his demand in a still more agitated voice. Who are you? Still, there was no answer. Once more, he cudgeled the side of his horse, gunpowder, putting him in motion and shutting his eyes, breaking forth with an involuntary fervor into a solemn tune. On with you! Move, you silly animal! Move! Uh, 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 Just now, the shadowy object form also put itself into motion, and it was at once in the middle of the road. The form appeared to be a large horseman, of large dimensions, but mounted on a black horse of a powerful frame. He made no move of molestation or social ability, but kept a roof on one side of the road, jogging along on the blind side of old Gunpowder, who had now not gone over his fright and was wayward in waywardness. Ichabod, who had no relish for the strange midnight companion, now quickened his steed in hopes of leaving him behind. Oh. Get on with the gunpowder. That's a good lad. The stranger, however, quickened his horse to an equal pace, thinking to lag behind. Whoa, 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 whoa there, gunpowder. Let's keep our head now, shall we? Uh, 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 uh. The other did the same. Ichabod's heart began to sink within him. He endeavored to resume his song to but his parched tongue clove to the roof of his mouth, and he could not utter a stave. There was something in the moody and dogged silence of this pertinacious companion that was mysterious and appalling. It was soon fearfully accounted for. Ichabod was horror-struck on perceiving that his he was headless! Uh, uh, I, uh, where is he? Oh, merciful Lord in heaven! But his horror was still more increased on observing that the head which should have rested on his shoulders was carried before him on the pommel of his saddle. Oh, on with thee, gunpowder! Move! Go! Go! Ha! Ha! Ichabod's terror rose to desperation. He rained a shower of kicks and blows upon Gunpowder, hoping by a sudden movement to give his companion the slip. But the specter started full jump with him. Uh. Away then they dashed, stones flying and sparks flashing at every bound. Ichabod's flimsy garments fluttered in the air as he stretched his long, lank body away over his horse's head, in eagerness of his flight. They had now reached the road which turns off to Sleepy Hollow, but Gunpowder, who seemed possessed by a demon, made an opposite turn and plunged headlong downhill to the road that leads to the bridge famous in Goblin's Confound it, Gunpowder! Where do you think you're going? Goblin's heart is on his head, unskilled for riding that was. Ichabod had much ado to maintain the seat, sometimes slipping on one side, sometimes on another, and sometimes jolted on the high ridge of his horse's back with violence that he barely feared would lead him asleep. Opening in trees, he cheered him with the hopes. The bridge was at hand. He saw the walls of the church glittering under the trees beyond. He recollected the spot where Don Bones' ghostly competitor had disappeared. If I can but reach that bridge, I am safe. Just then, he heard the black steed panting and blowing close behind him. He even fancied that he felt his hot breath. Another convulsive kick in the ribs, and old gunpowder sprang upon the bridge. He thundered over the resounding planks. He gained the opposite side, and now he turned to cast a look behind to see if his pursuer should vanish, according to rule, in a flash of fire and brimstone. Just then, he saw the goblin rising in his stirrups, and in the very act of hurling his head at him, he could not endeavor to dodge the horrible missile. But too late. It encountered his cranium with a tremendous crash. He was tumbled headlong into the dust, and Gunpowder, Black Steed, and the Goblin Rider passed by like a whirlwind. The next day, the 
next morning, Gunpowder was found without his saddle, with a bridle under his feet, solely cropping the grass at his master's gate? Ichabod did not make his appearance at breakfast. Dinner hour came and went, but still no Ichabod. The children all assembled at the schoolhouse, but no schoolmaster. We sent an inquiry on foot, and after diligent investigation, we came upon his traces. In one part of the road leading to the church was found the tracks of the horse's hooves deeply dented in the road. Just beyond the bridge, where the water was deep and black, was found the hat of the unfortunate Ichabod. And close behind it, Knots of gazers and gossips collected at the bridge at the spot where the hat and pumpkins had been found. They shook their heads and came to the conclusion that Ichabod had been carried off by the galloping horseman. Brombones, who shortly after his rival's disappearance, conducted the blooming Katrina and triumphed to the altar. <laughs> was observed to look exceedingly annoying whenever the story of Ichabod was related and always burst into a hearty laugh at the mention of the pumpkin. Which led Thompson some to suspect that he knew more about the matter than he chose to tell. Over time, some claimed that Ichabod was still alive. Ichabod is still living, mark my words. He's estranged his quarters to a distant part of the country. He keeps school there and studies law at the same time. I hear he's been admitted to the bar and planning on turning politician. Your country wives, whoever, are the best judges in this place. They love to tell the tales of the I'll be bound yet to me honor, even this very day that Ichabod Crane was indeed spirited away by supernatural means. Aye, says the truth to be told. But I ain't fool enough to offend the specter and disguise beings, the cause of old masters, Crane's death. And so it was that the bridge became more than ever an object of superstitious awe. The schoolhouse was deserted and soon fell to decay, and was reported to be haunted by the ghost of the unfortunate schoolmaster, and the plowboy loitering home of a still summer evening had often fancied the Ichabod's voice at a distance chanting a melancholy song to among the tranquil solitudes of Sleepy Hollow. The evening shadows have spread, and our man who has spent the better part of the last hour engulfed in an old dear Jack Knickerbocker's tail shifts in his chair, noticing the long shadows and hidden corners of the now darkened room, despite the unconscious smile darting at the corners of his mouth his neck suddenly feels exposed. Turning quickly in his chair, he involuntarily gasps at the squeaking of the wooden legs against the floorboards. <laughs> Laughing at his own folly, he says aloud, Now that was a tale indeed with the tallow of a candle. <laughs>